Ah, Faulty Towers. What can I say about the show that hasn't been said a million times before? The madcap antics of Basil Faulty and the rest of the staff at Faulty Towers as they try and manage a hotel has resonated with audiences throughout the years and remains just as funny today as it was way back in 1975 when it first aired. The show only ever had 12 episodes across its two series, but because it was so well regarded, it was always going to be a target for a remake and the USA tried three times to do it. And in this video, we are going to take a look at each of them in turn. The first show we are going to look at is called Snavely. This was an unaired pilot, so it never made it to a full series. But the first interesting thing about this adaption is that it was made in 1978. That means it is the only adaption that was made prior to the second series of 40 Towers, which aired in 1979, resulting in them only having the first six episodes to work with. Though they take bits from various episodes, the plot is mainly based on the fourth episode of 40, The Hotel Inspectors. In the original, that episode saw Basil hearing a rumour that hotel inspectors were in town, so he tried to work out which one of his guests was the inspector, and to then unsuccessfully treat them better because of it. I should mention that the quality of this, and a lot of the footage shown in this video, isn't great. It's mostly collectors that have saved this stuff to tape over the years, and then uploaded them to YouTube, so it is what it is. The show opens up in a hotel lobby, with the Manuel character having been replaced by a character named Petro. We then see Gladys Snavely, who replaces Sybil Fawlty, being played by Betty White. Take up. Yes, I'm still here, Roger. I do wish Petro would learn English. Uh, hang on. Sorry, Roger. We've had a guest waiting an hour for toilet paper. <laughs> In the original, they largely made Sybil play things straight and serious, with Basil carrying most of the comedy. But in Snavely, they've shared that more over the pair, and they both end up trying to be comedic. This does hurt the show somewhat, as it means you don't really have that straight man who makes the other characters seem more madcap in comparison. We then get our first view of the replacement for Basil, this time called Henry, being played by Harvey Corman. So Harvey Corman and Betty White, both big names at the time, so it's clear the show wasn't skimping on talent, and given Betty White's star status, it's understandable why they would want to expand her role in comparison to the original. So Henry walks in carrying a goat's head, he wants to mount on the wall, and then they have a bit of a tiff about it. How did you know? You hit it there! Roger, yeah. <laughs> Henry, you are not. Yes, Roger's certainly <laughs> on your mind, isn't he? I know you're always it's talking to him. Mind. Slip of the mind. You are not going to hang him in the lobby again. I am so when I find the hammer. Where'd you hide it? A guest rings the bell, and Harvey has a go at him for ringing it too much. Yes. Uh -huh. Stop that racket! <laughs> You'll be taken care of. Just wait your turn. <laughs> This is a point that's going to come up multiple times in this video across the different shows we'll be looking at, but I feel that American shows really don't get how to portray comedic anger. You see, in 40 Towers, when Bezel shouts at someone, he's doing it because he himself has lost the plot and his frustration has boiled over. It never feels like he's being actively angry and aggressive towards them. He's simply shouting for his own sake. The American shows just can't seem to get that aspect quite right, and often the anger and shouting comes off a little too genuine to be funny. The show continues in much the same way as the original. They meet a guest who is particularly picky, and Henry assumes that he must be the inspector, so tries to do his best to meet his every need. At lunch, we meet the Polly character, now called Connie, in what is probably a reference to Connie Booth, who of course co-wrote 40 Towers and played Polly in the original. There are some moments here that gave me a bit of a laugh, like this bit. I'd like a word with you. Uh, when I've finished my drink. <laughs> <laughs> you have. Then there are moments that are quite painful. Here Henry has to act as if he is pained by giving away a free meal, but the reaction just looks so artificial. It's on the house. I knew it. We then see the replacement for the Major, who is now the Chief, a former Chief of Police, and we get a joke which, let's say, has not aged very well. <laughs> There was none of that in Bassettville while I was chief of police. 
as I recall, <laughs> seems to me there was only one case of alleged rape in 12 years. A remarkable record, Chief. If that cashier hadn't pressed charges against me, we wouldn't have had any. <laughs> you, Chief? Oh, she was jaywalking, and I pulled her over for a sobriety test. Sobriety test? You mean she charged you with rape just for making her blow up a balloon? We had another test. I don't care to hear about it. <laughs> Henry welcomes the guest, and we get some shenanigans. The guest wants something fresh, ends up asking for an omelette. Gladys accidentally seats a guest at the same table, and Henry then moves him. There's a few interactions here, and we learn that in this version, Petro is an Albanian refugee. What do you want? Why are you standing there? Food, food. <sighs> what did you order? The diet plate. Uh, can't he speak English? <coughs> Albanian refugee. Might as well give your order to the cat. <laughs> I give them some marks for not going the obvious route, which would have been Mexican, and doing something a bit more creative for this character. We then get the reveal that the picky guest is not in fact a hotel inspector. This is taken much the same way as the original, but it doesn't make as much sense in Henry's reaction. You listened in? Yes. You listened in to a private conversation of one of our guests? That's right, Henry. The little rat, I'll kill him for this. <laughs> Pretending to be a hotel inspector. It was your mistake. <laughs> oh, Mr. Bishop, we missed you. You see, in Forty Towers, by the time that Basil finds this out, he spent a huge amount of time trying to cater to this customer's every whim, doing whatever he can. In Snavely, all he's done is been put in a room that the Snavelys were sleeping in and ordered an omelette. He hasn't done anything really that would draw such ire. They are taking the plot points and the reaction, but not the build up, which means that the reveal loses most of its impact and therefore isn't funny. We get a few more interactions in the dining room, including this moment in which Snavely sniffs this guy's cottage cheese. Never thought I'd say that. To taste it yet. Oh. Mm. <laughs> mm. Smells good. I'm sure you'll be as delighted with your dinner as our other guests. It's not really very funny, and I think this goes back to what I said earlier about how the character is portrayed. In Forty Towers, when Basil does mad things, it's funny because he himself has been driven mad by a situation, so him flustering about doing crazy things sort of makes sense in the moment. But here, it hasn't been earned. The character doesn't seem to have gone crazy, so when he does crazy things, it just really doesn't work. Henry actually strangles a guest to the point he passes out, then the scene ends. In the original, this is passed off much more as a funny accident, whereas here it just seems a bit sinister. The last part of the episode takes its plot from the sixth episode of the original, The Germans, concerning a fire drill, where Henry accidentally sets off for a burglar alarm instead, and various guests come in to see what's going on. There's this strange moment here where Connie laughs at Petro's actions in a very unsettling and unnatural way. It's sort of creepy. I don't like yes. it. Petro got confused and he thought the burglar alarm was a fire alarm. He chased everybody out of the dining room, out the back door. <laughs> the same thing happens that happens in the original. A real fire is accidentally started, but everyone thinks it's fake and just a drill. Henry accidentally uses a fire extinguisher on the guest before the scene ends. The final minutes of the show involve the real inspectors turning up, realising the hotel is in a state, and the episode ends. So, that was Snavely, and what can we say? Well, first thing to mention is that this really shows just how well Forty Towers was written. Each episode was formulated in such a way that the comic stakes kept growing and growing, little gags paying off for larger laughs, and everything just constantly building up. Snavely really falls down because it takes part of the plot, the inciting moments and the payoff, but loses a lot of the in-between stuff, a lot of the build-up, which means nothing really pays off in a very satisfying way. With a show as well written as Forty Towers, a remake even needs to be completely original, or be a shot for shot remake, anything in the middle just doesn't work, and this is proof. The actors do their best. Manuel and Polly replacements really don't get enough screen time to give them much of a mention, and both Betty White and Harvey Corman have been funny in other things, but these roles just don't seem to suit them. In particular Corman, who just can't portray the crazy guy losing his mind as well as John Cleese. Snavely never made it past this pilot, so for this one, we can end it there 
and move on to the second remake. Forty Towers aired its second and final season in 1979, taking so long to make, in part because Connie Booth was reluctant to do so, and following that, she retreated away from public life almost entirely, putting the chances of a third series at zero. Therefore it was back to remake territory, and four years later, in 1983, we got a show called Amanda's by the Sea. This actually got commissioned and aired on television, so let's take a look. Before we get on and talk about Amanda's, I just wanted to take a second and say that this video is not sponsored. So if you like what you see and want me to make more videos like this, click that big subscribe button if you haven't already, as it really helps me out. In addition, I have a Patreon in which I produce some exclusive videos, such as a look at the American version of the IT crowd. There's a free trial too, Link is on the screen now or in the video description if you prefer. Alright, back to the video. Amanda's takes place in California in a seaside hotel, with the eponymous Amanda being played by B. Arthur. The first major change compared to the original is that Amanda basically plays the characters of both Sybil and Basil. She is the main focal point of the whole show. This immediately creates a plot problem that Amanda's never really resolves, and that is conflict. Every show has to have conflict, and the main conflict in Towers usually comes between Basil and Sybil, Basil trying to hide something he's done or then disagreeing on how to do things. They didn't really find a good way to replace this dynamic in Amanda's and the show ends up suffering for it. Now because there are 13 episodes, I'm not going to go through each one scene by scene like I normally would and break it down. Instead I'll do more of an overview about the show and take a look at each of the characters and how they play out as otherwise we'd be here all day. The first thing I want to mention is that whilst this is a remake of 40 Towers, it does depart a lot from the original series. For example, with B. Arthur, they decided to focus on her strengths as an actress, which is being a no-nonsense, sarcastic with a sharp tongue, and throughout the series, most of her jokes are really her just giving one-liners back to customers. You're going to have to make the best of it, dear. You know, we tried to get into a good place. We didn't try hard enough. <laughs> I beg your I pardon. said we are going to try very hard to make your stay enjoyable. Are you guaranteed that this is a quiet room? 101 is our quietest room. You're absolutely sure. Would you like me to write it in blood? <laughs> Mrs. Cartwright, my husband is in need of a complete rest. That's right. I've just been through a very grisly murder trial. And just my luck, you were acquitted. <laughs> they ditched a lot of the physical comedy, as they must have deemed it didn't suit her. And as a result, the show is devoid of the frantic energy one would associate with 40 Towers, becoming a lot more relaxed in its hijinks. The character of Manuel is replaced by Aldo, who again is playing the same role of not being able to understand English. Aldo, Aldo, where's David? The man who was sitting here, where is oh, he? Oh, David, he go up. He what? He said to me he don't want to eat. So I say to him, go up to your room. <laughs> This character, I think, really does not seem to work in this version. In the original, Manuel was funny, only because he was constantly bouncing off Basil, each of them getting the other one more and more worked up, with both John Cleese and Andrew Sachs being brilliant at madcap physical comedy. In Amanda's, there isn't the physical comedy or the energy, so the interactions with Aldo just get sort of awkward and feel quite mean, actually. You just have this character of Amanda walking around, making sarcastic witticisms, and then Aldo running around doing a bad Manuel impression. The two don't gel together at all, and the character as a result just sticks out as totally out of place. Aldo. <laughs> Give me your bread. <laughs> One thing to note is that the first episode of Amanda's also takes heavily from the hotel inspectors, the same as the pilot for Snavely. I'm not sure why both shows decided on this one to use as the opener, but it's an interesting comparison. We get some new characters in Amanda's, namely Marty and Arlene, who play Amanda's son and daughter-in-law, respectively. The character of Marty is intended to be a point of conflict, as he took some kind of hotel management course, so wants to try and get his opinions over. But the actor just seems too nice, for lack of a better word, so the conflict never really feels that sharp. Please, I want everyone to remain calm. Marty, what are we going to do? Look, why don't we call Roy's? I'll order ribs and corn on the cob. You cannot serve a hotel critic ribs. The man is used to exquisite food on his plate, not a half pound of grease. <laughs> In terms of the dialogue, they take liberally from 40 Towers, but sort of plaster it all over the place without a huge amount of rhyme or reason. For example, 
We see here Amanda talking about the view to a room, which is taken pretty much line for line from the original. I am displeased with my view. All I can see out of my window is trees. But what did you expect to see out of a window in California? The Eiffel Tower? <laughs> or perhaps Krakatoa erupting? What I expect to see, Mrs. Cartwright, is a view of the ocean. Oh, well, maybe you didn't notice it. It's that big blue thing between the land and the sky. I know what it looks like. I just can't see it. Because Amanda's by the sea is not by the sea. Well, then, may I suggest that you move to a hotel that is closer to the sea? Or preferably in it. <laughs> you advertised... What I can't deny is that B. Arthur does do a great job of delivering these kind of sarcastic jokes. It's her specialty, and she does it really well. And whenever the show does use the better written lines from the original, it is quite funny. Unfortunately, you can't build a whole show around a couple of zingers. You need more depth, and it's a depth that Amanda's never really finds. It's really clear as well the divide between the sharper lines they take from the original and the ones that they have made their own. For example, the character of Arlene Marty's wife is completely original, so her lines are largely original and really not funny. I told Mother to send me fern green and this is more of a guacamole. Arlene, this wouldn't keep happening if you didn't insist on sending to Boston for all your clothes. I send to Boston, Martin, because I'm accustomed to the best. After all, my father is the third leading manufacturer of folding chairs in America. <laughs> Do you know me? I'm not one to complain, even though I was uprooted in, in the middle, middle of the, of the night, night and dragged, dragged away. She's supposed to be a sort of fashion-obsessed diva character, but she just comes across as annoying and just sort of there, never really playing much of a part in any plot or delivering any good comedic moments. The other two characters to note are Earl Nash, who plays a bumbling chef, and Zach Cartwright, who plays Amanda's brother-in-law, the two of which later become romantically involved. In terms of connections to the original, Amanda's does do its best to try and set it apart by creating new hijinks and settings by taking inspiration from the original. In this scene, Aldo shouts there is a fire, which Amanda tries to say there isn't, which is similar to the original, before it ends in a much more of a sitcom-y fashion, with a bunch of random firemen jumping in to save the day, which is definitely very different to the original. This happens quite a lot over the first half of Amanda's at least, where they take ideas and situations from the original and sprinkle them over the episodes, usually with different results. They do the same with jokes and dialogue too, taking a lot of the funnier lines from the original and peppering them throughout. At least, that is what happens for the first half of the series. By the second half, they have taken so much from 40 Towers that they need to start relying much more on original content and situations, and that's where the show begins to change. It's a weird tonal shift, but the show becomes a lot more like a dramedy as it goes on, with far less hotel-based shenanigans and more serious situations between the various characters, some even feeling a bit like a soap. There's even a whole two-parter which deals with Amanda getting involved with her brother-in-law and the various reactions her family has about it. I mean, take a look at these scenes from episode 9. Can you ever imagine something like it in 40 Towers? I, am, I feel guilty about Harry, and that's that. No, that is not that. You know what's making me angry it really has nothing to do with sex. It's that you just won't open up and tell me what's really troubling you, what's I, really bothering you. I told you I am telling you everything. I, Amanda, I am talking to you. Listen to me, damn it. Get the hell out of my life. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, no, yeah. That's okay. No, it is. Amanda, please, no, stay no, now. No. We can talk. No, no, I, I, I have to be by myself to, to think. Please! Ultimately, Amanda's By the Sea is really quite a strange beast. It didn't fare well in the ratings, which meant that only 10 of its 13 episodes ever got aired on TV. And I think I know why. For one thing, it's not clear what the show wants to be. The first few episodes aren't too bad, but the funniest moments are when they just take lines from 40 Towers, which doesn't really say much for the foundation of the show, and that foundation is pretty much the problem, because when those lines went away and they had used them all, the show just drifted and became something different. It's not unusual for shows to change over time as they find themselves, but to have such a stark difference between the first and ninth episode is really strange, and I can imagine viewers at the time didn't really know what to make of it. When Amanda's is at its best, is when B. Arthur is telling one-liners and jokes, and when it's at its worst, it's just a weirdly slow-plodding dramedy. I think the creators should have been more brave and just made an original show from the outset, 
It's clear that's what they wanted to do, and maybe it would have worked out better. But as it stands, Amanda's by the sea is just a footnote in sitcom history. After Amanda's failed to find an audience, it'd be 16 years until they gave it another go in their third and final attempt at remaking 40 Towers. In 1999, we got a show called Pain, but a hotelier on the coast of California. This show is a much closer adaption than Amanda's, going back to simply replacing the characters from the original on a much more one-to-one -one basis. John Larroquette plays Royal Pain. Haha, <laughs> get it? It's funny because it's a pun. Jo Beth Williams plays Constance Pain, who's referred to as Connie, another nod to Connie Booth. Julie Benz plays Breeze O'Rourke, the Polly character. And finally, Rick Patala plays Mo, who is the Manuel character this time from India. Before we get into the show itself, I just want to say that I think this is the worst of all three remakes. The main problem with this one is that it feels really sanitized and too Hollywood. The characters are much nicer to each other. Royal and Constance actually seem to like each other. Sex, no jewelry. <laughs> the three knows a woman hates the most. Let me take it upstairs so that it doesn't upset her. Let me take you upstairs. I want to give you your present. It's a sexy negligee with all the trimmings. <laughs> the characters are rarely the butt of the joke. Everything is just wound down and smaller. The problems are just misunderstandings that get resolved. Nobody flies off the handle and loses their mind. Instead they just get a bit angsty occasionally, but eventually put on a smile. The hotel itself feels too nice and too proper. Let's take a closer look at the show to properly detail what I mean. The first episode is called the J. Edgar Hoover Pin Story and is loosely based on the anniversary from series 2 of 40 Towers. In the original, Basil pretended to forget it was their anniversary and Sybil left the hotel in anger before he could explain, which runs the course of the whole episode and causes all the various events to unfold. In pain, they resolve this misunderstanding within the first three minutes of the episode and that's it, misunderstanding taken care of. My birthday. That's right. <laughs> Happy birthday, precious. It's our anniversary. Gotcha. <laughs> I know it's our anniversary. I love the way we play with each other like this. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> That's why our marriage has lasted 22 years. 19. We did it again. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> The episode is instead about him getting her a gift out of lost property, and that sort of thing happens over and over in this show. I want to take a second and talk about the character Mo, who is the Manuel replacement. This character just does not work at all. Because they made the show much gentler, this kind of over-the-top character just comes off as really awkward, doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, just a second, light of my life. <laughs> right, look, I need you to run upstairs. <laughs> Anything else? I need you to go to my room. That... <laughs> when you get into my room, go to my armoire. Anwar? Yes, Anwar Sadat. I've got the late dead president of Egypt in my room. No, it's a large wooden box in the room. Now go in it and get Mrs. Payne's jewelry box. What do you need jewelry box for? Well, because Mrs. Arby is what... What you just call me? <laughs> it's a lot like Amanda's in the sense that they seem to keep the character because there was an equivalent in the original, but had absolutely no idea what to do with them. So they just sort of float around in the background, occasionally popping up, but not really doing anything of note. Yeah, it just isn't funny. The character of Breeze also has a few odd changes compared to Polly. One of which is the fact that she's a virgin. I only mention this because for some reason it's brought up all the time in the show. I have never felt more dirty or used or more ashamed of myself. Yeah, just wait until you make love for the first time. <laughs> it's like they thought of exactly one character trait and then just stopped thinking of any more. So all of her characterization has to be around this specific point. I don't know why they keep mentioning it, but they do and it always comes off as unnatural. It's difficult to say too much about pain. It's really quite boring. It feels like one of those Disney or Nickelodeon children's sitcoms in which every joke is PG 
and situations get resolved neat and tidy every few minutes. It's a far cry from the sharp and witty comedy of Forty Towers. The constant conflict and energy of that show is just gone and we're left with a very boring and sanitised comedy. I suspect one of the reasons it turned out this way is that it was also produced by John Larroquette, who also stars in it. He probably didn't want to make himself the butt of the joke or make himself look bad and knew he couldn't do the kind of physical mad comedy that John Cleese could so turned it into this watered down mess. None of the remakes are good but I think this one is the worst just because it's not interesting, it's not fun and not funny, it's pure background noise, a lot of nothing. So that was the three American remakes of Forty Towers. There was also a German remake and Forty Towers has indirectly inspired hundreds of shows in one way or another, such an impact it's had on comedy. I think the remakes just didn't seem to understand why the original was funny or what made it work. They each took elements of it but just couldn't find a way to make them gel together. Forty Towers rests so much on the performance of his cast, the writing of John Cleese and Connie Booth, that remaking it seems an insurmountable task, and it turns out it was. If anything, it just makes me appreciate the original all that much more. Thanks for watching this video. Goodbye.